Okay, so Daniel 12, we have been uh, for many weeks now in this last final lengthy prophecy of the book of Daniel that wraps the whole thing up. And we had an entire chapter where there is the preparation uh, for uh, the, the, the lead up to the vision itself to the prophecy itself. The prophecy began in chapter 11, goes all the way through that chapter and into the first four verses of chapter 12. And so today we find ourselves then in verse 5, that now that the angel has finished speaking, we come back to Daniel. So I'm just going to read through from verse 5 to the end, and we'll come back. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on the bank of the stream and one on that bank uh, of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, he raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times and half a time and that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel. For the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. None of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. So here we are then, and Daniel's had this long, long, long vision. Um, well, prophecy explained to him. He sees the vision back in chapter 10 of a man clothed in linen who has a description that is almost identical to the description of Christ in Revelation 1. And I concluded that that was indeed Christ. And in response to that vision in chapter 10, he then collapses. He is brought back, as it were, when a hand touches him, sets him trembling on his knees, gets him to stand, and then speaks to him of what is to come. That one who touches him, I believe, is not Christ, but a separate angel, uh, for reasons that we explained at the end, during chapter 10. The angel then speaks to him of what's going to happen. We had a long history lesson of the Greek Empire, predominantly in the uh, beginning of chapter 11. And then we shift to the end times towards the end of chapter 11, specifically the Antichrist and what he will do and what will happen to him. Now then, as we come to chapter 12, the prophecy finished with uh, speaking of the nation of Israel, of how it was going to be crushed and then picked up, how Michael would fight for it, and how there would be resurrection, and there would be resurrection because the promises to the faithful saints of Israel will be fulfilled when they are risen from the dead and come to experience and enjoy the kingdom that God had long promised them. There you go, there's your recap of two and a half chapters. Now we come to verse 5. The, the prophecy is over and Daniel looks. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. Now I don't know about you, but um, when I was a kid um, back in that distant land that we call England, uh, we used to have a little stream by our house and I would, I would, as many English boys would do, I would go into the stream in my welly boots 
that's uh, Wellington boots to you perhaps. Um, now I go into the stream in my welly boots and, and, and look under stones and see if there's any fish hiding away and play around. And my parents thought that was perfectly safe, um, probably a sign of the times I think maybe, and that there was no danger of me being swept away in a torrent for it was just a little stream. Why the ESV chooses to translate the word that typically refers to the Nile River as stream is absolutely beyond me. Because there's plenty of things that I would think uh, words I could use to describe the Nile, but stream wouldn't be one of them. And, um, and I prefer obviously the ESV rendition of river. It is in the context here, as we would know from reading back, it is the Tigris River. And as he's there at the river, there are two um, uh, beings, persons, as it were, who stand, one on one side of it, the Tigris, and one on the other side. And then someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream. And there's a question that is then asked at the end of verse 6. But let's just get a picture as we do this. There's the Tigris, it's a big river, right? Not a stream, nudge, nudge, right? Okay, big river. We've got one being on one side and one being on the other side. And then standing on the river, above the river, I don't know if there's a gap or he's literally on the surface, is this one clothed in linen. Now, this acts as what we call an inclusio, bookends, like a sandwich. Whereas at the beginning of the prophecy, we had the man clothed in linen, and now at the end of these prophecy, we have the man clothed in linen. And the description of him was one that makes it clear to us, certainly those of us here who now stand after the writing of the book of Revelation, absolutely clear to us that that is Christ. So Christ is there and is about to speak to him, and he is above the water. And again, there are echoes of this when Jesus then at a later point will walk upon the water. We see Jesus above the waters here. And like in the gospel passages where that is there, there is this implication of his sovereignty even over the wind and the waves and the water and what have you. And so Christ is there above. So that's three people, but there may well be a fourth. Because it says, I heard someone said, someone said to the man clothed in linen, who is that someone? Is it one of the two either side? Possibly, possibly not. I suspect that the one who speaks and says to the man in linen is the angel who has been giving the prophecy previously. And so now we come to the end, the angel's given the prophecy, the angel speaks and asks uh, Jesus, the Messiah, the pre-incarnate Christ, this question and Christ is accompanied by two others which again is not unheard of in scripture because when God shows up and speaks to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre in Genesis 18 he shows up with two others by his side and so this again would be a nudge and a hint and an echo and an allusion to that passage and speak of the fact that this is the second person of the Trinity in his pre-incarnate form. So there's your scene. So hopefully you got it pictured in your head a little bit now. You of the media generation who prefer looking at the movie for a couple of hours than reading the book for three or four times the length of time. Um, now you have a picture in your head that you can consider as we go on. And the question that is asked to the man clothed in linen, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders. So the wonders that are being spoken of immediately preceding are the wonders, and, and we'll talk about that word in a minute, but the wonders of the period that he has just been speaking of. And the period that he's just been speaking of is the period in the second half of the last of Daniel's 70 weeks. So we have these 70 weeks, these 70 periods of seven years, and we know through the book of Daniel that halfway through that final 70th period of seven years, that in that second three and a half years, that there is an event called the abomination of desolation. We, we won't go through it all over again, we've dealt with it multiple times because it's come up multiple times in Daniel, but basically it involves a removal of the worship in the temple, a, an ending of the worshipping of, of God and 
the establishing of a false god, an idol, an image to worship in the temple. That was the abomination of desolation at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes during the Greek Empire. And we're told that there will be another little horn, another bad ruler in the fourth kingdom. And he also will have an abomination of desolation. That is the one that we refer to as the Antichrist. That will happen three and a half years into the 70th week. So that's, that's what's been going on in the previous couple of weeks that we've been teaching. And so when he says to them, uh, he says to Christ, rather, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? That contextually seems to be what he's referring to. When will this come to an end, these, these, these wonders? Now, with regards to wonders, we typically use the word wonders to say, oh, isn't that just wonderful, you know? What a, what a wonderful thing. Oh, how wonderful, you know? And, and therefore, if I, say, um, if I were to say, well, there's there's been a, a big car accident and everybody, people have been rushed to hospital and this has happened and that has happened and tragedy, tragedy, tragedy. You're like, oh my goodness, there's so much going on right now and it's horrible. When will these wonders end? You think that was a bit of an awkward thing to say because it's not wonderful, it's tragic, right? But the word wonder here, it simply means astonishing things. So when will all of these dramatic, astonishing things come to an end? So that's the question. The answer comes from verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream slash river. He raised his hand, right hand and his left hand towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times and half a time and that, that, that when the shattering of the, people, of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. The need for brevity during the tribulation, during the 70th week, or as it is most commonly called in scripture, thank you Isaiah, the day of the Lord, that this period of time, its brevity is emphasized as being astonishingly important. In Matthew 24, Jesus specifically says, if that time wasn't short, there'd be no Jews left. The suffering and the persecution for the Jewish people during that time, as we saw last week, will be greater than any period in Jewish history, including the Egyptian slavery, including the wilderness wanderings, and from our modern perspective, including the Holocaust. It's going to be the most severe period of Jewish suffering that will ever exist in Jewish history. Therefore, it needs to be brief. And so the angel here who has been talking about this suffering, it, presumably, or maybe the other voice is Daniel, and you can debate that amongst yourselves. I don't really care. The question here is, it needs to be answered. And the question is, this is essentially going to be short, is it? This, when is this going to come to an end? This can't go on. This is going to be horrific. This, is, this, this wonder, this is going to be horrific to behold. When will it end? And so there is a promise, and the raising of the hands to heaven is a typical form of swearing an oath. And Christ, who I believe this is, promises and swears on him who lives forever. And promise, you would say, on, on himself in that case, but in, the, in the, the Trinitarian God, perhaps would be a more accurate rendition. But there is a swearing and a promise that this will be for a time, times, and half a time. If you take time as singular, time as plural, and then half, then you have one, two, uh, one, and then a two, and then a half. And if your math is good, it's one plus two is three, plus a half is three and a half. There's your three and a half. And, and that's not like a riddle, that's not supposed to be complicated. It, it's a way of emphasizing, and it may be that there's, there's more significance to this breakdown, but it's a way of emphasizing, look, it's going to be exactly this. This is what it's going to be. It's going to be this three and a half years. We were told it was a week. We know the abomination of desolation happens halfway through the week. So it's not like three and a half years hasn't been told already. But there is this emphasis. And notice in the text, and this is important, that he swears by the one who lives forever that it will just be this brief period of time. In other words, what he's saying here by the use of this comparative, comparative of time eternity to time brevity is that what he's saying is that he who stands outside of time and he who controls all of time he ordains that this time will be mercifully brief that's essentially what's being said here 
And so it is that that for that time, times and half a time, for that three and a half years, it will be that, that period of suffering. And he emphasizes again the suffering. He said that, that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. In other words, as he said earlier, there is a specific purpose to the Jewish suffering during the tribulation. There is a specific purpose. This is very important. Now, it, it, I don't want to get too distracted here, but I'm going to go down a, a, a rabbit trail and hopefully it'll be mercifully brief, briefer than the times, times and a half time, but it'll hopefully be brief enough. But I, I want to just go down this little thread for a little bit. Um, and I want us to understand, we live in an era where the vast majority of Christians around the world are Gentiles, not Jews. And when the church began, Acts chapter 2, book of, book of Acts, uh, Pentecost, when the church began, every single one of the first converts were Jews. <clears throat> the church was exclusively Jewish. It wasn't until Acts chapter 8 that the Samaritans, the sort of quasi mud blood half breed Jews that they hated so much, that they were allowed to become part of the church. And by the time the Gentiles can become part of a church, that's Acts chapter 10, we're, we're, we're a long period of time, at least over a decade beyond the starting of the church. So if you went to a church meeting, a gathering of the saints, in the first couple of decades, after the resurrection of Christ, and you were a Gentile, you were in the vast minority. And then Gentiles started getting saved. And then more, and then more, and then more, and then more, and then more. And eventually the churches all became predominantly Gentile. And this is the reason behind the writing of the book of Romans quick plug, which we're teaching Wednesday mornings 10 a.m. for the ladies and Wednesday evenings at 7 for the, for the gents. And this is why we're, we're going through it. It's such a crucial book. And in the book of Romans, Paul is writing as the apostle to the Gentiles to a predominantly Gentile church that initially, because it was founded very, very early, was predominantly a Jewish church. And they're trying to wrestle with these issues of why were we all Jewish to begin with and now we're all Gentile now? Has God finished with the Jews? What's going on here? And Paul answers all of those questions. And the answer, predominantly, as we abbreviate for sake of brevity here, the, the answer is, is that God has blinded the Jews. He keeps a remnant of Jews, as he always has done throughout history. And so there are Jewish Christians. There are people of Jewish descent, Jewish, the Jewish race, who are also Christians. We tend to call them Messianic Jews. But they are very much in the minority, but they do exist and they are a remnant and their existence stands as a statement from God that he has not finished with his chosen nation. However, God is predominantly dealing with Gentiles and Daniel has been dealing with the time of the Gentiles. And in this time of the Gentiles, God's dealing is predominantly with Gentile people. But Paul tells us in Romans that that will come to an end fullness of the Gentiles will come in and God will predominantly deal with the Jewish people again. And so I think that it's very easy for us in this point in history as we stand in the church era where the Jews are very much the minority, much of the church has throughout church history dealt with the, the paucity of Jewish believers by essentially claiming that God's finished with them, that God's done with them. And so passages like this really stand out because what God is saying here is that the time is going to come when the Jewish people will be dealt with again. God will focus upon them. And as he lays his hand upon them, it will be a time of shattering. A time of shattering. Always reminds me of that line in Fiddler on the Roof when Tevye says, Lord, I know we're your chosen people, but can't you choose someone else for once? You know, I mean, that, there's a lot of biblical truth in that statement. Because God's people seem to have been prioritized for a special type of suffering. And here is a prophecy that there will be a type of suffering that will be greater than anything they've experienced before. And it specifically says that they're going to be shattered. And I got Matt this morning to read to us from Psalm 2. Because the same Hebrew word for shatter is used there. 
And what we have in Psalm 2 is the establishing of the messianic kingdom when King Messiah will come and rule on his throne and his enemies will be crushed, the Gentile kings will be crushed and they will be shattered. And the answer for everybody, for the whole world, is to take refuge in the Son. To kiss the Son and to find refuge in Him. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. And we have that repetition of blessed here as well, which is my other little nudge that perhaps this, this passage is alluding to Psalm 2. But what, what that, if it is, and I think it does, what that does is creates a fascinating parallel where Psalm 2 is saying, Gentile nations that stand against God, you will be shattered before Christ. And here, the same word is being used of the Jewish people. You will be shattered. Now, there is a difference in the shattering. There's a difference in the purpose of the shattering. And there's a difference of the timing of the shattering. But the parallel is incredibly important nonetheless. So the Jewish people are going to be shattered. And it will, it will be for the purpose of destroying their power, ending their power. Bring, it's a shattering of the power of the holy people. You're like, well, the, the Jews don't seem to have a lot of power at that time. There's an abomination of desolation. It's illegal to be Jewish. They're being persecuted. What power are you talking about? You know the power he's talking about? He's talking about the pride in their heart. He's talking about the pride that would prevented them from seeing that their Messiah had come to them. The pride in their hearts that led them to blindness. The pride in their hearts that exist to this very day. The pride in their hearts that led them to worship idols. So that the prophet Isaiah said that you will essentially become like the idols you worship. They have no eyes, they have no ears, they cannot see, they cannot hear. And you will neither be able to see nor to hear. And that will be the judgment upon you. And thus it was. And then Christ came and they rejected him as well. And thus Christ repeated Isaiah 6 and repeated the repetition of that judgment of blindness upon the Jewish people. There is such a pride in the Jewish people because such great light was given to them and they rejected that light. They had the covenants, the promises, the patriarchs, the history. The Messiah is their Messiah. And yet they rejected him. And so it is that their power and their pride must be shattered. And so it will be. It will be shattered. And then these things will be finished. I'm not going to make a big point of this, but I'll mention it in passing. And maybe the Holy Spirit will finish this part of the sermon in your own hearts. But many of us stubbornly refuse to hear what God's saying. Many of us stubbornly refuse to bow the knee, stubbornly refused to give up our will and our way, stubbornly refused to do what the Lord says. And it makes life rather hard for us. And we say, oh Lord, how long? Not always, but sometimes the answer is, once your power has been shattered, then it'll be finished. Don't presume I'm speaking to you. The Lord will finish that one if he needs to. So it is then that that will be the end of the three and a half years. It will serve its purpose, the power being shattered, but it will be for a specific length of time, the time times and half a time, three and a half years. And after those three and a half years, then the power will be shattered, the people will be crushed, and then they will cry out to him they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for a son. And the Jewish nation as a whole, at that point in history, they will cry out for Christ, whom they, their ancestors pierced, whom they as a nation pierced. They will cry out to him for him to return and to rescue them when they are on the brink of destruction and extinction. And at that time, the three and a half years will come to an end and he shall return when they call and we've dealt with those passages multiple times as we've gone through Daniel so then in verse 8 I heard but I did not understand then I said oh my Lord what shall be the outcome of these things now what, what is fascinating here is the first question revolved around timing. The second question revolves around outcome. What is the outcome of this? What happens? Well, I just told you. 
I just told you what happens when, when the people are crushed, they cry out for Messiah to come. Messiah comes and we have the second coming of Jesus Christ and he destroys his enemies and he rescues the people who cry out for him and he establishes his kingdom. Now how, how come I'm, I, I'm, I know that and I've mentioned that before? Because we've already dealt with it in Daniel. We dealt with it in chapter 7 specifically when the Messiah comes on the clouds. In other words, even Daniel didn't understand everything when it was first given to him. Ain't that an encouragement, huh? <laughs> that the one to whom scripture was given and wrote it down didn't fully understand it at first time. Most of you are following the Bible reading plan that we have as a church. We've been doing Bible reading plans for, for years and years. Um, Jen and I do it together now. She's been doing it for decades, longer than I've been doing it as a specific discipline. And every time we go through it, we come across stuff and we, and we read it and we're like, oh wow, look at this. And it's like, Jen, you've been doing this for 20 years. Have you just noticed this, you know? And the answer is, well, yeah. Yeah, I have just noticed it. And how is it that you read something in the Bible for the 10th, 20th, 100th, 200th time and you see something you haven't seen previously? The answer is this, because you've learned more about the Bible in the preceding year. And now you have a better foundation of understanding and now you can put the next layer on top and then the next layer and the next layer. It's like when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle and you get a piece and you're like, where on earth does this go? And then another hundred pieces that are easier go into place and now you can see where that more difficult piece goes. It becomes easier as the puzzle becomes complete. And so it is with our Bible reading, that as we spend more time in the Word, as we have other revelation, as we dwell on it more, as we see it in harmony with other scriptures, then the, the, the Bible becomes clearer and clearer to us. And I take you know, someone as, as, as dumb as me, I take great encouragement in the fact that even Daniel didn't understand the book of Daniel at the beginning. So that's, that's a really encouraging thing. He doesn't understand and he wants to know the outcome. In other words, what he's really asking here is when the people's power is crushed, is shattered, when that happens, you know, what's going to be the, the result of this, what's going to happen? And again, this has been dealt with already in Daniel. And because it's already been dealt with, Look at verse 9, this is great. He says, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the end of time. Just get your head around what's being said here. Daniel is a prophet. He is now 80 plus years old. He has seen multiple visions. He's seen astonishing visions. Right at the beginning, when he was but a teenager, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he has to pray. God gives him that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. So not only can he interpret the dream, but he can actually tell Nebuchadnezzar what the dream is when Nebuchadnezzar hasn't told him or anybody else. So Daniel's had astonishing revelations from God. He's seen amazing things. And here now he's having this huge, long, final revelation that ends with the words being sealed up. And Daniel is asking a question about the revelation that he has had when he's been told in verse 4 at the very end to shut the words up and seal the book. And he's like, okay, no, no, can you just clarify this? And I, you know, I'm doing a very loose Anthony version paraphrase here, but essentially what is said to him is this. You've already been told the revelation's over, shut up, go back to what was previously said. Or as people often say when they try and slow down internet debates, I refer you to my previous post, my previous answer. Right? That's what's going on here, in that the revelation has now been sealed. You want to know the outcome? Go back and look at what you now have that has now been sealed, but don't ask for further revelation. Now, isn't that an amazing thing in this era, when we have entire wings of the church that live for hoping for a fresh word or revelation from God? Oh God, speak to us afresh, speak to us anew. This is God's answer. The book's been sealed. Why don't you read it? And it's not always the case, but it's, it, it is a bit of a, a, an axiomatic truth that those people who are so, most desperate to receive some fresh new word and revelation from God are often, normally, most of the time, those who have the least understanding of the 66 books he's already given them. We need to be people of the word. 
Do you want to hear God speak? Read your Bible. Do you want to hear him speak something fresh and relevant and contemporary? Read your Bible. You want to, you want to learn something you don't already know? Read your Bible. You want answers to the questions of life that you need? Read your Bible. You have a particular problem that's come up, you want answers to it? Read your Bible. Read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it. And when you've read it, read it some more. And, and get equipped in the Word. This is why we teach verse by verse. Because this is God speaking to us through His Word. And the shutting of the book is, is such a crucial concept. Now obviously, this isn't speaking here in Daniel 12 of the close of the canon of Scripture and how the book of Revelation ended the, the canon of Scripture. It's not talking in the book of Jude about the, 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 the faith that was delivered once for all the saints. You know, there are other New Testament passages that we would argue this from, but the principle is here. That when the book is sealed, when the book is shut up, then if you have questions that are answered in the book, go back and read the book. Pretty simple stuff. And so um, it is sealed up until the time of the end. Now that's important. A lot of Christians seem to think that prophecy is done and dusted and finished forever. Well, it's done and dusted and finished for now because in the church era, there's no more prophecy. Ephesians 2.20 says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. I don't know about you, but if I was living in a house where the foundations were still being built, I would be a little bit worried sleeping at night. The foundations are done. They're finished. We are now the bricks being built upon the church. So prophecy is gone for the church other than the prophecies that we have in Scripture, right? But there will be a time at the end when there is prophecy again because the book of Revelation speaks about these figures who are called the two prophets. There are going to be prophets and prophecies at the end. There will be an unsealing and opening of further revelation in the time of the book of Revelation. So that's always worth remembering. Verse 10. And here we have a, a little bit more of a clarification on, a repetition, I suppose we could call it, of the outcome that was asked about. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. Or as a friend of mine says, heathen's gonna heathe. That's kind of how it is, you know? It always amazes me. This is, you know, this is a problem in America, I think, more than any other country, because you, you view yourselves as being a Christian nation, or at least some people do. Um, what do you expect unbelievers to do other than to be unrighteous and live unrighteously? I mean, that's what heathens going to heathe. Wicked, gonna, wicked people are going to act wickedly. I mean, that's, that's what we expect, right? Should we expect any different? And I think that one of the dangers of American churches over the years has been an attempt to sanctify the unjustified. An attempt to, to make better people of those who are dead in their sins. That's a, that's a futile exercise. The only hope for America is not, con it's not conservative politics. It's not your favorite candidate for president. It's not, it's not a removing of critical race theory from schools and a, and, and a returning to biblical understanding of human sexuality in schools. These are good things and I'm for them and I'd vote for people if I had a vote, but I'd vote for people uh, one day, it'll come. Um, I vote for people who would want those things. I'm not knocking those things. What I'm saying is that doesn't save anybody. The only thing that saves people is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, which we're going through in Romans on Wednesday. Just another little plug. And it begins with a message of condemnation, the wrath of God being revealed from heaven. It continues on to explain that the Savior from that wrath is Jesus Christ, whom we trust in by faith. We trust in his sacrificial death, burial and resurrection in our place for our sins. And that that allows God to declare us to be righteous without reneging on his own righteousness and his own justice. And it is then, once we've been declared to be righteous, once we've been saved by faith and not by works that no one should be able to boast, that God then sanctifies us and transforms us and purifies us. We must never get these things muddled up. There's no point in sanctifying someone who is dead in their sins. You know? 
Hey, dead person, want to go for a walk? Hey, dead person, want to hang out? Should we play ball? No, they're dead. And so it is with those who are spiritually dead. They cannot do spiritual activities. And so many will purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. And the point of this is that this is the outcome. Why are you shattering the people? Because many will be made pure. Many will be purified. Many will purify themselves through the act of repentance, through the act of crying out for Christ to return, through this national repentance. Many will be purified. There will be many who will be saved. That is the outcome of the tribulation. Why does God allow a period of such intense suffering on the earth and particularly for his chosen nation? Why would he allow such a thing? Because he's a good God who wants to see people come to repentance that they might be saved and enjoy the blessings of the kingdom. That's why. One of the most important things for us as Christians to learn, to grasp, to get our heads around and to embrace is this truth that when our sovereign God allows us to suffer, often in just horrific ways, that he does it because he loves us. That's so hard for so many of us. It's, it, it can be a brutally difficult lesson to learn. And, and if I might be frank here, and if you might give me some grace in this, the degree to which we find it hard is the degree to which our pride needs to be shattered. We have to let God break us so that he can rebuild us, to shatter us so that he can purify us. And he loves us too much to allow us to go on in our pride and in our selfishness, professing the name of Christ, playing church, without there being true transformation of our hearts. He did not save us from sin so that we could go on living in sin and somehow get a get, a get out of jail free card at the end of our lives. He died for our sin that we might be free from the power of sin now. Hashtag Book of Romans Wednesday nights, Wednesday mornings. <laughs> You see why we're doing the book of Romans? You see how important it is? It's a crucial, crucial thing. So, so there will be purification that happens through the time of suffering, but not for all. The wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And again, we have this parallel, this sorry, contrast between the wise and the wicked. The wise are the ones who are saved, the wicked are the ones who aren't saved. They're foolish and wicked. The wise are wise and not wicked. That's, that's the parallel. It's a very common Hebrew concept. And what's going on here is that there will be understanding of the book of Daniel in the last days. Daniel has spoken about there being a time of tribulation, there being an abomination of desolation, about a world leader who will set up an image of himself and call people to worship him. He's spoken of an intense time of suffering for the Jewish people that will end with the restoration and resurrection of the Jewish people who were saved previously. All of that is contained in the book of Daniel and it's completely true and I believe it. The sad thing is that many Christians today don't believe these things. They don't believe in a literal kingdom. They don't believe in a literal tribulation. They don't believe in a future restoration of Israel. They allegorize away the prophecies of God and they don't believe this stuff is literally going to happen. Do you want some good news? When it happens, they'll believe it. <laughs> Every Christian will believe it when it happens, right? You know, um, the majority of the church allegorized so much of the Bible for most of church history because so many of the prophecies were prophecies concerning the nation of Israel. And from the first century onwards, there was no nation of Israel. But then in 1948, there is a nation of Israel. And a whole bunch of people go, oh, oh, hold on a second, and things start to change. Well, when you see the Antichrist killed, and you see him resurrected, when you see the two witnesses killed and then resurrected, when you start to see the prophecies of Revelation happening, then people are going to believe it. And the wise at that day will understand. And as, as silly and as humorous as it sounds, that is literally what the text is saying. It says, when this comes to be at the end, the wise will understand. They'll know. I don't understand, says Daniel. No, well, you know, when it happens, they will. <laughs> That's kind of how prophecy works, right? So, so when prophecy is fulfilled, everybody will understand. Well, everybody who's wise will. 
Well, you know, heathens can heave. Wicked are going to be wicked. What, what do you expect, right? So when Jesus came, he fulfilled countless prophecies at the time of his first coming. So that people who were wise, like Peter, could say, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God. And then the Pharisees, who were the experts in the law, turned around and said, no, 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 he's possessed by the prince of demons, Beelzebub, that's how he does miracles. Wicked are going to act wickedly, but the wise will understand. That's how it works, when prophecy is fulfilled. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Folks, if, if a week wasn't clear to you that it meant seven years, it was to the original readers, and if a time times and half a time wasn't clear that that was three and a half years, it was to the readers, I think we can work with days, can we? All right, 1,290 days that the abomination will, will uh, be in place. So you've got the regular burnt offering taken away, and then you have the abomination of desolation set up, and there is 1,290 days. That is not saying, as I think some versions can imply, that from the time of the end of the offering, it'll be 1,290 days till the abomination of desolation is set up, but rather the offerings end, the abomination is set up, and then there's 1,290 days. In other words, there will be, it will be in place for that long. All right? Okay, does anyone, any, any mathematicians notice a problem here? When you have a Jewish year with Jewish months, then you have a different number of days than we have in our years with our months. And if you have three and a half Jewish years with three and a half uh, Jewish years worth of months, then you have 1,260 days. We've got an additional 30 days here. We've got an additional 30 days. What does that tell us? <clears throat> that tells us that from the time that the Jewish suffering ends, when they call out on Christ, he returns and he starts to <clears throat> destroy his enemies, it will be another 30 days before the abomination of desolation is taken down. And if you think that the additional 30 days is problematic, you just wait until the next verse. <clears throat> Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. We now have a 75 day period from the end of the tribulation, after which 30 of those days, the abomination of desolation is set down, and the blessing comes 75 days, another 45 after the abomination comes down, after the, the tribulation ends. In other words, there is a 75 day period between the ending of tribulation and the beginning of the kingdom. 75 days. You say, well, why? Why? Well, let's come up with a few ideas. Firstly, one of the things that has to happen, as we see in the text, is the removal of the abomination of desolation. Now let's remind ourselves of what that is. The abomination of desolation is where the Jewish temple has been used to host an image of the Antichrist, and quite what that image is, we don't know. Whether it is a literal statue that is supernaturally brought to life, whether it is, as some people today suggest, some form of clone, whatever it is, we don't know, but there is an image of the Antichrist that comes to life that we see in the book of Revelation. But this has to be removed and taken down, and it was put in place of the Jewish sacrifices. Now, we don't even have a temple in, in Israel right now. There's no temple in Jerusalem. All that is left of the old one is what's called the Wailing Wall. That's it. And when the Jews are asked, do you want to rebuild a temple, there's a problem in that they believe that the temple can only be built in one place, and there's a big stinking mosque sitting on that place right now, the Dome of the Rock. There's no way of them, of them being able to build the temple without removing the Dome of the Rock. How is this going to be resolved? Well, we can have our ideas. I think Ezekiel 38 and 39 will play a part. But we, like with all prophecy, will find out and God will be proven to be true as he always is. Okay, so it will happen. But there will be this temple during the time of tribulation that God has not authorized, that God has not endorsed, that is not something that God asked for or wanted. 
and yet it's there. But in the, the time of the kingdom, there will be a temple. The temple will be on the highest mountain, Isaiah 2, and it will be built and people will go up to Zion to worship in the temple. That may be the highest literally in that there may be a crushing down of the mountains and a raising of others. There may be geographical changes at this time in history. There may, it may be that it's just something of significance in the sense of the highest and most important place. It may be that the temple has to be readjusted for there to be a tribulation temple. It may be that there's a completely different temple rebuilt in a completely different place. We just don't know. But there's a bunch of stuff that has to happen for the kingdom to be established. Because when the kingdom begins, the king will be inaugurated as king in the, his, on his throne in his temple. Isaiah chapter 6, I saw the king high and lifted up on his throne in the temple, right? There's stuff that has to happen. How long is it going to take? 75 days. That's how long it's going to take. The removing of the abomination and the idolatry in the old temple, 30 days, and then the establishing, 45 days. So when you look at how long it took to rebuild Burbank Boulevard and the bridge over the freeway, that's a pretty good time schedule right there. We can wait for 75 days. So, but what's being said here, what's being said is that the blessings of the kingdom will come to those who wait and arrive and survive and get to the start of the kingdom. Now, before you, you're concerned here and you're worried and you say, well, hold on a second. So you're saying that I could, that, that somebody could be there, not us because we're the church and we've gone long before, but someone could be there, they could be a Christian, the second coming of Christ could come. And then they could be walking down the street at some point in the next 75 days, trip, smash their head and die and miss out on the kingdom. That's not what's being said here at all. What is the danger then of people surviving the 1,260 days, but somehow not making the 1,335 days? Well, the answer is, is that not everybody who survived the tribulation will get to see the kingdom. Let's go through that, shall we? Let's turn a little bit to your right as you go through your Bible, just a couple of books to the prophet Joel. I'm going to go to prophet Joel and Joel 3. <clears throat> I've taught this a few times over the years. If you've not heard this before, this is going to blow a few minds. Mostly because in a moment we're going to be in the New Testament and we're going to deal with a passage that has been woefully taught and has been taught wrongly a lot and misunderstood. And uh, Joel is, is necessary that we clarify, for us to clarify that New Testament passage. Hopefully you're there now. We just had to go from Daniel to Hosea to Joel. Um, for behold, Joel 3, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, when is Joel speaking of? Hey, Joel, when you say at that time, what time are you, are you, are you talking about? Oh, it's funny you should ask that. It's the time of the restoring of Judah and Jerusalem. So there you go. We know exactly when it's going to happen. And, and, and again, just, just to be clear, uh, many Christians today don't believe there will be a restoration of Judah and Jerusalem. And Joel seemed to think there would be because he says it very clearly. Right? We don't want to allegorize uh, God's word and make him to not have said what he's clearly said. Otherwise, we end up like Abraham in Genesis 17, where God says to Abraham, you and Sarah are going to have a kid next year. And, and, and Abraham says, no, 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 I've got Ishmael, I've got Ishmael. Ishmael's the descendant. And, and Abraham is essentially saying to God, you're interpreting your own promises wrongly. Let me correct you on this. We don't want to be in that kind of boat right now, do we? So we want to be very, very clear and say, well, Joel says there's going to be a restoration of Judah and Jerusalem. And it's at that time, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Right. What are the nations? The word nation is the same word as the word Gentile. The nations are the nations in contrast to God's nation, the Jewish nation. So the nations... And I think sometimes in our modern Christian circles, nations just gets to mean everybody, but it, it specifically means the Gentile nations in distinction from Israel. And so he's going to gather the Gentiles and bring them down to a specific geographical location, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It's always amusing. If you have somebody who's, and you say, well, do you not believe in a final restoration of Judah and Jerusalem? What do you do with Joel 3 verse 1? 
and they'll try and allegorize it away. And you say, well, that's fascinating. So what is, what is it gathering the, the Gentiles in the Valley of Jehoshaphat mean? How are you going to allegorize that one? It just makes no sense unless you read it plainly. So the, Jew, the Gentile nations will be brought down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. This is going to happen when Judah, Jerusalem is restored. Okay, so let's just get our bearings here, right? The Jews have been shattered. Their power has been removed. Their pride is gone. They've repented and they've called out for Christ to return. Two thirds of them have been killed in the last part of the tribulation. One third of them have remained. And the ones that remain have cried out for Christ to return. And they have all been saved. As Paul says in Romans 11:26, all Israel shall be saved. And so the Jews are all saved. They're all saved. All the ones left are saved. Jesus has returned. He returns to Bosra, Isaiah 63, who is this who comes from Bosra with, uh, comes from Eden with, with blood on his hands. Um, he comes from Bosra and he comes and destroys the armies of the Antichrist who are about to wipe out the remaining Jews. And he comes and then he gathers the Gentiles. There are so many Gentiles that are alive on the planet at this time. Many of them were just trying to kill the Jews a few minutes ago, and they're now, their blood is now running down the mountainside. But there are plenty of other Gentiles, Gentile cities, Gentile nations, Gentile places. And they all have to come to one specific geographical location, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That takes time for them to get there. Oh, how long will we need? I don't know, 75 days maybe? All right, you're getting my gist. So they're there. And I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage, Israel. Notice two things. Firstly, Gentiles are being judged, not Israel. Why is Israel not being judged? Because Israel's been judged by God for the last three and a half years. And that judgment has now been complete and the nation has been purified and that those who have been judged have been removed, they've been killed through the tribulation, and the third that remain are now saved. So there's no, the, the judgments, Israel's judgment is now passed. It's occurred. But now the Gentiles need to be judged. But they're going to be judged, secondly, this is the second point, they're going to be judged on the basis on behalf of the people and the heritage Israel because they've scattered them on the nations and divided up the land they've cast lots pardon me for my people and have traded a boy for a prostitute and have sold a girl for wine and have drunk it in other words the Jews have been treated so woefully and so shamefully in the tribulation it even gets to the point that the Jews that aren't killed initially that they're kept as slaves and then they're traded. Oh, you know what? I want a glass of wine. Well, here, have my, have my Jewish slave and now you can have a, gla a glass of wine. That's the value that they are given. Anti-Semitism is such a satanic thing. So, two things. The Jews aren't being judged, the Gentiles are. Second thing, the Gentiles are being judged on the basis of how they have treated the Jews. That's the context. Does everybody see? I mean, that's as clear as day, right? The Gentiles are taken to a specific location where they are specifically judged, and they're specifically judged because of how they have treated the Jewish people. Right, now let's go to a much more well-known passage. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. I'll give you a little bit longer to go. There's only a few more chapters, a few more books. You just flick through a few minor prophets. You get through your Nahums and your Zephaniahs and Zechariahs. You get to the last of the prophets, that famous Italian prophet, Malachi. Or Malachi, as you might know him as. Um, and then we come to Matthew. Okay, we should all be there by now, after that appalling joke. Um, Matthew 25, verse 31. Verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. Okay, just like Joel, the timing of this is 100% clear. When is, what he's about to speak about, when is it going to happen? When the Son of Man comes in glory. When does he come in glory? He comes in glory at the second coming. This is going to happen at the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ, which we also know through our studies in Daniel and elsewhere, is going to be the same time that the Jews are restored, because it is they who will cry out for him to return as they finally come to repentance, and thus they're purified, and thus he comes and returns at their call to save them from their enemies. Yes, so all at the same time. And all the angels with him, and he will sit on his glorious throne. So the returning of Christ, 
comes with the establishing of the kingdom and him sitting on the throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will, uh, and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Okay, let's just get our heads together here. At what time, the second coming of Christ, what is going to happen? He's going to judge the nations. What's that? That's the Gentiles. And who's going to do the judging? That's going to be Jesus. In other words, if you're a Jew who knows your Old Testament and Jesus starts saying this in Matthew 25, verse 31, you say, oh, I know this. This is Joel 3. Because Joel 3 talks about the time at the end when the Messiah comes in glory, the nation is restored, when the Gentiles are judged. And why are the Gentiles judged? They're judged on the basis of how they've treated Israel. That's Joel 3. He'll separate the sheep on, uh, uh, on his right and the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When do we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. This is a passage that is well known and it is beloved of those who have and embrace a social gospel. It is, it is in its worst form of application, it becomes, it becomes something whereby if you don't do exactly what I want and give me what I'm asking for, then, then you've rejected Jesus. It is, it is a passage that has confused Christians over the years because it seems to imply a works-based salvation. And those who love a works-based salvation, i.e. those who reject the gospel, those who want to, to water down Jesus into being this sort of woke figure who's, who's a, a raving socialist and, and, and wants you all to treat one another and, and oh, you know, you, you didn't welcome the, my transgender brethren and therefore, you know, you're, gonna, you know, you're not going to see the kingdom. And it becomes this kind of nonsense. I remember one particularly bad uh, heretic teaching on this once and saying that he'd been on a, uh, a missions trip, which means a kind of a, a socially, practically helping people out rather than preaching the gospel, but a, a, some sort of trip to, um, I think it was Guatemala, it might have been Haiti, but it's, it's somewhere in Central South America area of, of great poverty. And he, as he was leaving, there were some young little kids who were running, he was running up to him, please take us with you, please take us with you. And then, and of course, he couldn't, he wasn't allowed to, and he goes in the plane and he flies off and he looks down and he thinks of these little children that wanted to come back with him, and the words of Jesus rang in his ears. These little ones, when you reject them, you've rejected me. This is not what this passage is saying. It is a specific point in history, the coming of Jesus Christ, the second coming, and it is concerning the judging of specific people, Gentiles. Why? Because Gentiles have survived to the end of the tribulation and unlike the Jews who have already been judged through the tribulation, they haven't all been judged and they need to be judged because what happens next in human history is the beginning of the kingdom that was promised way, way back and Daniel's been speaking about forever long when Jesus is going to set up and rule and reign from his throne in Jerusalem and rule over the whole world and we're going to have a kingdom of a thousand years where Jesus rules and reigns and there are people who don't get to come and be part of that kingdom because they are not saved. And how is Jesus going to check and see if they are saved or not? How did you treat the Jews? And that's the brethren here. You, when you did it to the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. And when you see the parallel with Joel 3, you cannot interpret the brothers and the brethren as being anything other than his physical, racial, genetic brethren, i.e. the Jews. You can't see it any other way because this is essentially a repetition of and an expansion of Joel chapter 3 and the judgment of the nations. And so it is, is that at that time, the delineation between those who follow God and those don't becomes abundantly clear. As Daniel has said at the end of Daniel 12, the wise are going to understand the prophecies. They know that this is the Antichrist. They know that he's trying to wipe out the Jews. They know that God's going to save the Jews. They know. They understand. 
And so all those who truly believe and know are going to not be killing Jews and persecuting Jews like the Antichrist and his people, but rather they're going to be saving Jews and risking their lives to save them. And so this will be a basis of Jewish um, of the Gentile judgment. Now you say, well, why doesn't he just say those who believe, and we know that those who believe would treat them the right way? Because this is the completion of a theme that has gone throughout the Old Testament, which is this. The Jews reject Yahweh and commit idolatry. God punishes the Jews through Gentile nations. And then God punishes the Gentile nations for how they treated the Jews and restores the Jewish nation. And we've seen this cycle multiple times throughout history. We saw it in Egypt with the Passover. We saw it with the Babylonians and the captivity. We see this all the time and it's going to happen one last time. And if that means that us as Christians have to say, oh, it looks a bit workspace to me, then you'll have to deal with that because it's showing us more importantly the completion of this cycle. But it is those who are declared to be righteous that shall live righteously, or as Habakkuk says, the righteous shall live by faith. Quoted in Romans 1.17, which we did on a Wednesday night recently, on well, Wednesdays recently. Just that's the last plug, that's it, done. I'm done with that now. So all of that is to say that he then, he then um, sends people to judgment or, or welcomes them into the kingdom purely on the basis of how they've treated the Jews, which is an outworking and evidence of their faith because they were justified by faith and the faith that they have is justified, as James says, by their works. There's no contradiction here at all. So returning to Daniel for the final time, Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. You know what? If you survive the tribulation, congratulations. But you may, you're, if you're a Gentile, you're about to go to the Valley of Jehoshaphat and things may get worse. So, you're blessed. Notice again the allusion to Psalm 2. If you take refuge in him. You're blessed if you kiss the sun. You're blessed if you accept God's will and God's ways. The, then you will pass the judgment and you will enjoy the blessings of the kingdom, you and all other Gentiles who are truly saved. And Daniel is then told in verse 13, but go your way till the end, and you shall rest and stand in your allotted place at the end of days. There's no judgment of Jews, as we've said, because they have been judged and they survive. And all living Jews will now have a place in the kingdom that they as a people were long promised. And as Daniel has said earlier in chapter 12, there will be a resurrection of Jews that they may also enjoy that kingdom. This is, this is as clear a statement of resurrection as anything previously in the chapter. Daniel will stand in that kingdom. Look at the text. He shall rest. Daniel is 80 plus years old. He's about to go and have some rest. His life is almost over. But the resting of Daniel is not the end. This is why the Apostle Paul speaks of believers falling asleep when they die. He shall have a time of rest, but he shall stand in his allotted place at the end of the days. He will have his inheritance like all other Jews in history who have believed. The Messianic Jews of the church today, the Jews of history, the patriarchs, all faithful Jews. They will stand in the kingdom that God has promised them. And those of us who are found to be faithful, those of us who find our refuge in their Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, we get to be part of that kingdom too. Praise God for the book of Daniel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your kindness in giving us this magnificent book. So much revelation. I pray that we would have learned so many things through this book. But above all else, I pray that we would learn to trust your word as it is clearly written and plainly spoken. We would feel no need to allegorize, to twist and to turn but we would just accept the truth of your word. 
And Lord, I pray that everybody here today, that they would trust in you, trust in your word, and that they would be declared to be righteous, that they too may have a place in your glorious kingdom. Amen. Thank you.